Hey everyone, Jason here. I'm gonna double check that we're live on Facebook. So I know the one time I don't check is the one time it won't work. We don't want that. We have a great guest today. I'm really looking forward to learning more about what she does because she does some amazing things all around the, the entire world, which is pretty impressive. It looks like I am there. Awesome. So hey there. I'm Jason Logston, and this is Exploring Sous Vide. We're all about helping you get the most out of your sous vide machine while talking to some of the biggest names in the industry. And today's sponsor is the ISVA Sous Vide Summit 2021. It's uh, going to be a virtual event again this year. We didn't feel safe putting it on in person in San Francisco again, like we were um, planning on. That's been pushed out. But uh, going virtual again this year, last year was a great time. And we're going to have three days of sous vide fun, sous vide education, along with an additional day of professional lectures for chefs and restaurateurs. We're still narrowing down the agenda, but we have several prior speakers coming back, including Michael Kelly, formerly of Everidge, now at Mara Farini, uh, Chef David Petranzik, of course, will be doing a cocktail demo, uh, Chef Eric Villagas, Carmen and Kevin Koo from Kind of Cooking, Chef Gerard Bertalone, Chef AJ Schaller from Crea, and um, Rich Rosendale is supposed to be coming back as well. We're going to have some more big announcements. So we have a few big names we're not um, releasing yet to the public, but uh, it should be a great time. There's going to be hands-on cooking segments, another cocktail hour, and like I said, some big exciting names that Mike and I are very excited. You can sign up for that at the isva.net slash summit live. Um, and one of the benefits to doing these shows live is you can say hi in the comments. Let us know where you're from. we got Mark Webb, Richard Jensen, Mike Lashardi, Bob Logston, my lovely mother, uh, Warren East, Patty Wiseman, um, it's great people from all around the globe coming in and joining us. Rosemary Simpson. How's it going, Rosemary? So remember, all these episodes are available as a podcast on your favorite podcast players, or you can join us live Thursday when we record them. You can ask the guest questions, talk to the other cooks in the in the comments, and even see our smiling faces. We got uh, oh, Kathy Bear, my mother-in-law. She always tunes in, but I don't think she normally comments, so she's being brave today. Welcome, Kathy. I know she's a big fan of today's guest, so I know she was tuning in specifically for that. So join us Thursdays at afmez.com slash show or search for Exploring Sous Vide on your favorite podcast platform. Okay, on to the show. Sous Vide is often used in home kitchens. It's used in restaurant kitchens, and some people even take it with them when they're traveling. But how about on a yacht? Today's guest is the perfect person to help us figure out how to use one. She is a chef whose passions lovingly revolve around culinary arts and the ocean. It is with thanks to her sister that her eyes were open to a career on the high seas, sailing more than 250,000 miles in many of the world's most beautiful places on prestigious yachts and cooking for the rich and the famous, all the while growing her skills, winning cooking competitions, and even writing a cookbook. Her expertise in creating exquisite flavors and artistic presentations is renowned throughout the industry. Can't wait to learn from today's guest, professional, charter, yacht chef, and author of Made with Love, culinary inspirations from around the world, Chef Elizabeth Lee. Chef, welcome to Exploring Sous Vide. Hello, Jason. Thank you for having me. I really appreciate you joining in. We've got a lot of people joining us from around the world. We've got uh, Virginia Lee's just hopping in, uh, Barbara Eggerman, Darren Wilson. Uh, people are tuning in uh, to hear about all the cool stuff you've been up to. Yes, thank you for the introduction. That was that was quite something. <laughs> <laughs> I always like reading other people's. The, you know, the, no one likes writing it, but they always like hearing it. <laughs> so I can't wait to dive into sailing the high seas with sous vide. But before we get started, I always like to ask, what is it like around your dinner table on a typical day? Oh, what is it like around my dinner table? Well, I can say that everyone's usually quite hungry and they're always very excited about what's going to be brought to the table for sure. <laughs> <laughs> and my family, we usually spend most of the day cooking just to have such an amazing meal at night. And is most of your meals with the, um, the guests on the yacht? Uh, we actually do not eat with the guests. Um, oh. It's quite fine dining. So we serve them breakfast, lunch, and dinner. And we also have hors d'oeuvres prior to dinner as well, which is usually on the Sunday. Nice. I need uh, I need that uh, going on here. That's basically what my wife gets is <laughs> everyone me <does>. chefing. <laughs> I chef for her, but I, I have to cook my own stuff. 
<laughs> and first off, I want to say congrats on your cookbook. Yeah, Thank I you a, very much. You're nice enough to send me a copy. It's a beautiful book. I love the photography in it. The recipes are great. And it's got some great uh, water shots as well. Yes, my husband, the photographer, he's and the designer of the book. Very, very amazing. He did a very good job. It's. Uh, I know you had one of my original books. This is a, a lot more beautiful than, than, than my, my original <laughs> it's a, book. It's a little bit different. <laughs> yeah, slightly different audience. <laughs> What was your inspiration behind your book? Uh, my inspiration, I've wanted to write a cookbook ever since I graduated from culinary school, which was 20 years ago. And my inspiration was definitely my mother, who has written or co-written about 32 books. Uh, so as a little girl, I was always with her in the kitchen, and she has inspired me a great deal to become a chef and to also write my own cookbook. So your mom did 32 cookbooks? That's yeah. crazy. What were they about? Uh, they're, they're called the fla they're a flavors line of cookbooks in Canada. Uh, what she did is she would take uh, recipes from restaurants all over the Maritimes, and she did one on the Pacific Coast as well, and she would adapt it for the home kitchen. And it was more like a cookbook guidebook that they sell in gift shops around Canada. Nice. So you, have, uh, you yeah. think you have another 31 cookbooks in you as well? Uh, definitely not. <laughs> but I'd definitely like to aspire to write one or two more for sure. It did take me 10 years to write this one. So, <laughs> uh, What was the hardest part about writing and publishing your first book? Um, it definitely took a lot of time to do all the testing, retesting, testing again, the writing, the editing. Everything was, I don't know if it was, say, diff difficult, but it took quite a bit of time. Lots of We're time. Were there any recipes that gave you a harder time than any others? Um, not really. They're all kind of uh, difficult. Maybe the sous vide foie gras in the rest in the cookbook. It was a little bit difficult. I had to test that recipe about five or six times, which the other ones I kind of knew because I'd done them so much, and I only had to test once, maybe twice. I have not done sous vide foie gras before, but I know a lot of people have. What's the, it's, it's a, delicious. I know it's a big multi-step process. Can you talk a little bit about what goes into it? It did actually, the, it's showcased in the cookbook, the recipe, and it does take about three days. It's, uh, you have to be patient with that recipe. But <laughs> not it's faint really of heart. Nice to, yeah. <laughs> it's really nice to do it sous vide because you don't have much waste with the product. You don't you lose a lot of the foie gras in the cooking step which originally sous vide was actually adapted for that in the 1940s so that they didn't lose the product in France in the major restaurants. And it also, when you cook it sous vide, the, the flavor is really infused deep down into the center of the torchon. And I think it supersedes the traditional method, in my opinion, for flavor. Wow. And you, you roll it, right? And then you sous vide it at a pretty low temperature. Is that correct? Uh, yes, you do. I forget the temperature off the top of my head. But yes, you have to remove the veins. And then what I do is I season it with a spice mixture that I make myself. And it's got about seven or eight different spices from star anise to clove. And then you also use cognac. And you dust the foie gras. You roll it into a torchon. And you use saran wrap to make it into the round shape. And then you cry back and you cook it sous vide. And then you allow it to rest for a day. The reason why it takes three days is just the resting and cooking steps. So it's nice. not uh, on hands for three days straight, <laughs> of course. <laughs> it's like corned but beef or something that it takes a while, yeah. but you're not exactly like. <laughs> but you're not doing it the whole time. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but it's a very great product. I think it's a delicious recipe. It's very nice. I might have to try that. Uh, maybe we'll, uh, next in-person conference, since they're all three days, we could do a three-day uh, hands-on class that meet for like That's a half cool. hour every day to just put together a Why foie gras. Yeah. <laughs> and then at the end, we could do a foie gras pizza, which is one of my husband's favorite recipes, which is also, he talks about in the book. Tell me more about the Very foie gras good. pizza. <laughs> I feel like that's so, going to make people buy your book just for that. <laughs> right? <laughs> it may. <laughs> so you use a Bianca base, just a white pizza. And I have a caramelized onions that I also make in the book that are made with the Han GSM wine, which uh, the Han family vineyards, the people that I'm currently employed by, I use their wines in a lot of the recipes. And actually all the recipes were paired with the wine as well in the book. And you do a chutney and you add that to the pizza and you bake it and then you bring it out of the oven and you add the sliced foie gras on top and you torch and serve with a little bit of basil or arugula and it is absolutely delicious. 
<laughs> that sounds amazing. Did I sell you on it? <laughs> yes, I, I am in. We're going to have to do that. The 2022 um, event. We'll, yes. we'll do a. We can do a three day three day yacht cruise with the ISVA, and we'll just make uh, foie gras the whole time. I'm here. Even better. Come to the Bahamas. <laughs> the prices might be slightly higher than the virtual summits price of, uh, <laughs> of twenty dollars and hundred dollars. <laughs> Uh, Darren wanted to know, how do you handle cooking in the rough seas? Uh, very good question. It is quite difficult. And if it's too rough, you do not cook. And actually, coming back to my cookbook as well, a lot of the recipes are adapted to with advanced preparation. And then you prepare the final plate just before service. So working on a yacht in order to juggle when it's rough and when it's calm, you try to do as much prep as possible when either you're in port or in the calm seas. And then obviously with the advanced prep, you can just uh, heat it up right before service. Have to focus on things that don't have, <laughs> don't have liquids that can slosh out. And yeah. Out, right? yeah. <laughs> it's not easy. You have to be very organized when you work on a yacht. I can, I would also think that like, you're serving a lot of times probably on the guest schedule. Is that right? That like you might tell them like this is when it's going to be, but if they get caught up with some great snorkeling or something like that, it's absolutely, absolutely. And that is really why I love sous vide so much because when it comes to sous vide, you can leave it in the water bath for an extra 20, 30 minutes while they get out of the water and take a shower. And uh, I asked you this pre uh, when we were in the green room, but what uh, tell everyone where you currently are so people know where you know I'm I'm here in snowy Brooklyn right now, and you're coming <laughs> to us from uh, sunny Lyford Key, New Providence Island, in the Bahamas. I'm very jealous of the uh, the sun and water right now. It's been a while since I got I to enjoy say, that. It's quite nice at the moment. <laughs> <laughs> I know some of our uh, listeners are in Texas and they are currently not happy because they are colder than normal and they don't have heat. So yes, uh, that's unfortunate. Sorry to hear that today. <laughs> are most of the recipes from your book um, things that you have cooked on the yacht? Or are they things that you created specifically for the book? What was kind of the inspiration for some of them? Um, majority of the recipes are ones that I've done in the past, and they're actually all of my favorite. As I've been chartering for quite some time, and as you probably know, we're, I'm constantly creating food every single day. And the recipes that I chose for the book are what I thought were the best, my favorite. <laughs> You didn't put it like, oh, well, this one was mediocre. I might as well toss yeah, that no, into this throw thing. It in there. <laughs> a bunch no, of strangers will be judging me by. Yeah. yeah. No, I did not do that. <laughs> Dan, the recipes have any particular significance to you or, you know, special stories attached to them? Uh, yeah, quite a few of them do. Um, let's see, in particular, the duck confit and lentil risole recipe. The lentil risoles are a take, I kind of elevated the dish a bit, but when I first went to Turkey, um, I took cooking lessons from a friend of mine's mother who, Turkish cooking lessons for an entire day. She didn't speak any English. She was about four feet tall and she just loved what she did. And she loved the fact that I was in the kitchen with her and wanted to know everything about Turkish cuisine. She would just talk to me and talk to me. And the one thing that I absolutely love that she made was this lentil risole. It's absolutely delicious and very versatile. And so I added that into the cookbook and kind of as a little tribute to her as well because she was so cute. <laughs> <laughs> what, is a, what is a risole? A risole is, it's a little patty in Turkey and it's a, it's, they make it with the hand, they form it with the hand, almost like a nigiri. And it's made with bulgur and lentils and then usually they put uh, cooked vegetables inside and then they serve it in a little lettuce wrap and you eat it. It's very traditional, what they call meze in Turkey. Do you try to take cooking classes and explore the cuisines at the different ports of call when you go there? Or are you just too busy cooking on your own yacht the whole time? <laughs> I'm usually quite busy, but no, when I do have time, and normally when we go to port or if we're in a certain country with the boat, we're there for two, three, four months at a time hmm. sometimes. So when I do have time off, I go and I go to the restaurants, I meet the chefs, try to get them to teach me the different culinary things that they have in the country. And I go to all the farmer's markets and I really try to learn as much as possible. What are some of the cuisines that you've been able to explore that really jumped out to you as that you've tried to assimilate more into your own cooking? 
Uh, definitely Turkish cuisine, as I, as you probably know, I've spent quite a bit of time there. Uh, and the Middle East as well. Uh, the Middle Eastern cuisine is it's very diverse and very flavorful. It's really understated. And Italian, I mean, I spend so much time in Italy, and of course, that's my favorite cuisine. And it's right. so diverse, so delicious. I'm really influenced Wait. by those a lot. We have Stefan uh, Boer from Stefan's Gourmet, does a lot of Italian cooking, and it's his. he goes over there. He's in uh, Amsterdam, but he goes to Italy oh, as much it. as he can for food tours and cooking, and he does. Oh, it's just the food there is so amazing. Yeah. Yeah. How many people are generally on your yacht that you're cooking for at a time? Uh, currently, the boat that we work on, Pegasus 9, she sleeps six guests, and we have three crew on board. So not nice. very many. It's it's very nice. So you can do a little more elevated meals exactly. a little more easily. Yes, very much so. And the galley on board is quite a large galley, which normally on yachts are quite small and compact. So I'm, I'm I really like the situation that I'm in at the moment. It's very nice. So, so do you do all the cooking yourself? Do you get any help from the other crew, or is it? Oh, I have help up from. Oh yes, everyone. My husband is my sous chef. Warm yes. <laughs> and our stewardess at the moment, uh, Vicky, Vicky Leal, she's also a huge help. They both are. We all work together. Nice. What does a, like a charter cost? Are we talking like a grand a day or like a hundred grand a day? What is like a wide range? Well, uh, boats, there's a huge wide range with yachting. Uh, this boat in particular, we go for $4,000 a day. Uh, we're thirty-two, thirty-three thousand dollars a week, and plus APA costs. So that's all the cost of the vessel, food and fuel and everything. But when in yachting, you can have it range from five hundred dollars a day to you know hundred thousand dollars a day. It's, it's <laughs> quite. <laughs> there's a huge range. <laughs> <laughs> and is that kind of what you specialize in? Is having like like gourmet food, or is that typical on a yacht? Um. It depends on the yacht that you book for sure, but it's definitely you anticipate if you're in the bracket where you're spending more than a couple of grand a day, you have gourmet food. You have a that chef on board. Yeah. I know that'd be a requirement for me if I was spending. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Where's the food? Yep. <laughs> <laughs> do you, you know, you're out on the sea. Do you catch fish while cruising to serve for the guests? Do you like do things we like that or is it all picked up in port? Yeah, no, a lot of it, usually I have everything that I need for my menu for the week on board. And of course, if we ever catch anything or have guests on board that go out and spearfish every day, for instance, and bring back fresh fish, that's what we have. The menu changes, it's fresh, whatever comes on board. <laughs> what, uh, what type of fish are you really excited when somebody catches that you can use? Uh, all, but uh, my favorite <laughs> for sure is yellowfin tuna. Oh, or a nice mahi-mahi. Nice. I, I, a fresh fish is a beautiful fish. <laughs> is there <laughs> is there anything that people tend to catch? You're like, oh, no, not this again. Everyone catches it, and it's I'm tired of using it. Oh, I would say I don't use it, but a lot of people catch barracuda on board yachts because the barracuda, they always take all the lines, but you can't actually eat it because of cicatera hmm. disease, unfortunately, so they always end up throwing it back. But every time it comes on the line, I go, to myself, oh, another barracuda. <laughs> <laughs> I always just get it in the way. It's <laughs> always, every time. <laughs> um, and how long do you normally go out for when you're doing a cruise? Oh, uh, we do term charters. Usually it's for one week, one week to 10 days, but it's whatever the guest stipulates, whatever they'd like to go out for. Hmm. What, uh, what's your favorite area to, to sail in? Well, I have to say now, um, I, the Bahamas, uh, we've sailed all over the world, except I have not been to the South Pacific yet, which I cannot wait to cruise. I may change my mind once I sail there, but at the moment, the Bahamas is number one. Nice. It's so beautiful here. The turquoise water, and it's gorgeous. What's your favorite area to eat in when you're sailing around? Italy. <laughs> Should have done that one. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> that's easy. <laughs> What's some of the cool wildlife that you've seen when you're you're out on these cruises? Oh, we see wildlife all the time. Every single time we go out here in the Bahamas, we see dolphins, we see sharks, we see spotted eagle rays, stingrays, fish, you name it. 
it's it's a gorgeous location. And you do snorkeling and scuba diving as well, right? Yep, I don't scuba dive as much anymore, but I do. We do a lot of snorkeling and di- free diving things like that. We go out when we're uh, when we have the guests on board at least once or twice a day, and I try to go as much as possible because I like to film with my GoPro under the water and do videos. It's one of my favorite pastimes. You have some great shots on your Instagram account of some of the wildlife that you uh, yeah. have videos of. Thank you. We swam Which with one? dolphins last week. It was amazing for my husband's birthday. <laughs> that was nice to, to plan that for his birthday. This I know, birthday. wasn't it? I, I thought, thank you, Mother Nature. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Richard Jensen wanted to know, have guests ever made any special food requests that were really hard to fulfill? to fulfill while away from port? Oh, yes. Like every time charter guests come on board. The dietary needs that people have nowadays are sometimes mind blowing. Uh, but you adapt and it, it, it usually works. <laughs> <laughs> if not, I just always give them more vegetables. <laughs> <laughs> nice. No one can complain too much about that. Yeah, right. <laughs> I feel like uh, last year I would have you know, asked what it's like being in a small enclosed space with your husband all the time. But considering my wife and I haven't really left our New York City apartment in the last year because of now you know COVID, <laughs> I could relate a lot more. Uh, how, how is it, though, with the two of you working together on pretty much everything? Um, well, he's my best friend and he is my soulmate. So for him and I, we've been together since day one. And it's just it's it's a pleasure to work with him every day. And he, he did all the photography in your book as well, right? Yep, all the photography and the design of the book as well. And we're we're a good couple, let's say. <laughs> <laughs> you never like saw a photo at the end. You're like, the dish looked a lot better than this. You know, come on, sweetie, you need to need to take better photos <laughs> next time. <laughs> Maybe only because the dish wasn't photogenic. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Definitely not, not his, his photography skills. I don't think. <laughs> <laughs> You mentioned to me that you've been, you made a turnip and miso recipe you were um, uh, t- uh, testing. Can you talk a little bit about that one? I did. Actually, uh, last week I was testing uh, some turnips and I, t- I sous vide them in a miso broth. And then I removed them from the broth and lightly mashed them with a the white miso paste. And the outcome I was delicious. I was very pleasantly surprised. So, so much, in fact, that my employer said, Elizabeth, this has to go in the next cookbook. And what, how long did you sous vide them for roundabout? I was for one hour. One hour? I had like 183 or something. Yeah, I'm Celsius. So it must have been uh, 83, 83, 85. Yeah, it was 83. I'm like, I can, I can generally do that one because it's either 183 or 83 or yeah. like right around there at least. <laughs> Close enough. <laughs> yeah. And it, it's really good. I'll have to write it down and send it to you. So you can, I'll yeah, have to test I, it again. <laughs> <laughs> I have some, uh, some of those in the fridge that I need to uh, do something interesting with besides just. Uh, well, yeah, no one ever cooks with turnips and, you, yeah. and they pair so well with miso. And I just thought, and it really turned out extremely well. I was very happy with the outcome. I'm going to have to dive into that. Uh, yeah, we got some really big ones from a local farm that are like giant purple ones. So The big be. ones are the best for that, for that sous vide uh, recipe. It's awesome. Nice. I'm going to give that a shot for sure then. Uh, Michael Goldman wants to know, can guests participate in the cooking if they're interested in participating? Absolutely. And actually the way the, the galley is set up on the boat that I currently work on, it has an open window and it's quite a large galley. So people come in all the time or they stand in front of the window and they watch me cook. And uh, every day, actually, usually people come in and we even do, I do cooking lessons as well. I feel like that would be a valuable, <laughs> valuable use of time on the yacht is learning from some yes. of the amazing things that you do. <laughs> yeah, people have fun with it for sure when they're not snorkeling or diving. <laughs> <laughs> And uh, last year, you won our comfort food contest with your creme brulee recipe. I did. Thank you very much for that, by the way. Uh, what went into that? Can you talk a little bit about the creme brulee process for those that don't know it? Uh, for the creme brulee, so I use the mason jars to cast and cook in the sous vide bath. 
And what it is, it's just a generic kind of custard base, which you don't have to cook and bring to temperature. You whisk all the ingredients together, and then you cast them into the jars and then cook them in the sous vide bath at 80 degrees Celsius. Is that 180? What is it in Fahrenheit? Sorry. I, I think it's like 180, 183, right around there. I'm horrible with the conversion. For one hour, Sorry. and then you remove and allow to cool and set in the fridge overnight. And then what I did, which was a little bit different than your traditional way of just serving in the jar, is I would take a, the tip of a paring knife and run around the edge and then just remove it onto a plate, take it from the uh, mason jar and brulee the top and then serve it so it was removed from the jar. I thought it was nice. Yeah, I remember your presentation was so amazing that you you always just see creme brulee in the in a container that's you know brulee on the top, and it was really really nice. Thank you very much. I tried doing that when I made a pumpkin creme brulee, and one looked really pretty and was like you know really cool looking, and the other one looked like cooked chicken thigh, and oh, it was awesome. it like smushed kind of a little bit. I was like, oh, I guess that's mine. My wife will yeah. have the pretty one. I'll I'll, I'll do this one, but. <laughs> I can't win every time, Jason. Yep. <laughs> that's, why I, that's why I plate each thing twice. So I, I have twice the odds of having one look yeah, decent. That's why I always <laughs> make extra. <laughs> uh, Darren mm -hmm. Wilson from Firewater uh, Cooking wanted to know, what's the weirdest food request you've had? Weirdest food request I have? That's a good question. Mm. had quite a few requests maybe not weird per se but i've had guests come out of the water and with all kinds of sea urchins and they're like here you go can you open these up and serve them for me right now i'm like okay <laughs> is this safe in this warm water <laughs> not weird but i definitely get you know a lot of interesting requests <laughs> people just I, I found this old boot at the bottom yeah, of the water Did i found you... this dead fish on the beach can you <laughs> grill it up for me <laughs> like, I'm, I'm good but i'm not that good <laughs> yeah. yeah michael goldman was asking how has covid impacted your cruises oh uh, we it impacted us quite a great deal actually we had to cancel all of our charters last summer and we were in port for three months and here in Life Key in the Bahamas, and we weren't even supposed to leave the boat. We weren't even allowed on shore for three months. That's crazy. So now yeah. you can at least do some cruises and you're we back are, up running a little bit? Yeah, they've organized it now. So the charter industry here in the Bahamas is active. They're doing quite well with it, the, bah the Bahamian government, or how they're allowing us still to, the tourism industry with the yachting, still to be moving still for all the guests to be able to come in and we're actually fully booked for this summer season. Nice. Yeah. That's good to hear. I'm glad you're getting back on uh, booking Fingers everything. Fingers crossed again. we still keep our bookings, but yes, it's very good. Uh, Chef Johnny um, Gabaldon says, have you ever had a chance to use any unusual ingredients from the different countries you visit? Uh, yeah, definitely. I've, I've used unusual ingredients. Um, I had once when I was in Turkey, there was um, a gentleman who had some bull's testicles, which they showed me how to, <laughs> how to create and serve, which I have to say were quite chewy and not really edible. <laughs> that's basically what i would have expected that if that's an unusual ingredient like. i think it is <laughs> yeah that's <laughs> what you, you don't just pick that up at the grocery store right once Isn't or twice problem? a week <laughs> <In New York? laughs> yeah new york has a lot of weird food but that's uh that's, i've not seen that else. around yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and uh warren said lionfish Yes, lionfish. It's a very invasive species, especially here in the Bahamas. So we've had chartered guests that will, when they're spearfishing, they go and spearfish the lionfish. And I personally don't like to take all the scales, but apparently if you have a, if you've taken a course that you can remove the quill and skin the lionfish, then you can serve it. And we had a guest a couple of weeks ago that was on board that spearfished uh, one and brought it on board and I did a ceviche. That's it's awesome. Very nice. It was it's nice to be able to work in some of the uh, some of the cool ingredients that people are just kind of pulling out of the water and finding for you. Yeah. 
uh, you also said that you, I think you said you use sous vide to can fruits and vegetables. I do. Uh, before the charter season starts, I usually do a lot of canning or because we have a garden here in Life Key, if I ever have a plethora of vegetables, then I use it for canning. It's it's really, really good, actually. And you just use um, normal mason jars and cook it to a higher heat for until it's yep. pasteurized? Yep, I do. I do. I use regular mason jars. I sterilize them first, like boiling the regular method, and then I cast them and then... Uh, use the sous vide to can them. That's very cool. Pasteurize. How long, how long do you cook them to sterilize them? Um, I forget, but it's, I think three hours. I forget the uh, temperature though. I apologize. Right. High temperature, <laughs> right? <laughs> it's on chef steps. Oh, is, nice. Yes. One of my favorite websites. Rick Hahn asks, um, have you published any recipes that are available to us to check out prior to buying your cookbook? I know Mike put the creme brulee link from the dessert showcase that you um, did for us, um, but do you have any other recipes out there for people to get a, a preview or a sampling of the cool stuff you do? You know, I do not, Rick Hahn, and that's a very good comment, and I should put on my social media platforms, I will post a few recipes. I think that's a very good idea. Thank you. <laughs> Everyone <laughs> follow Chef Lee to make sure that you get her soon to be released uh, preview recipes. Yeah, soon to be released. <laughs> <laughs> First announced on the Exploring Sous Vide show. Yes, the upcoming you Ta -da. <laughs> <laughs> uh, You talked about sous vide um, using sous vide to infuse fruits with flavors. Yeah. Can yeah. you talk a little bit about that? That sounds fascinating. I do uh, one peach dish in particular where I just have the peaches and I infuse it uh, with a little bit of kefir lime leaves and I also use vanilla beans. And then you just, um, I use the displacement method to put the sous vide into the, to the peaches into the bath and then I cook them for 30 minutes at a, I believe it's 83 as well. And they're nice. delicious. And they're it just softens firm. them up a little yeah. bit. and. Yeah, they're beautiful. They're firm and, and, and the flavor's infused right to the center. And you can also dust them with a little bit of sugar and torch them or brulee them and serve. It's very nice. I love your your platings. They're very inventive, very creative. How do you go about trying to figure out how to plate some of these dishes that you come up with? Oh, good question. Um, I spend a lot of my time looking at food photographs. And I think I just kind of, or Michelin starred photographs in particular, I just try to absorb as much of the plating as I can and different styles and different techniques. And I will start cooking something and literally I put a plate out in front of me and I will try to visualize that plate before I even start so that it's, well, in my opinion, so I try to make it as perfect as possible. Nice. So you kind of know what you're trying to accomplish as you're going before through I start the whole plating. process. Yeah. I try. Sometimes it never turns out that way. <laughs> you never know. <laughs> yeah, I can relate to that. Other people are like, oh, yeah. that looks amazing. You're like, it's not at all what I was trying That's to accomplish. not what it was supposed to look like. <laughs> Mike commented on, uh, I put out a recipe of, there was some caviar with like an egg yolk on, you know, toast. And um, he was like, we were talking about what, what we're going to do a hands-on cooking class. And he was like, you know, you could do your egg yolk. And I was like, Dude, I was trying to do a poached egg and it stuck so bad to the shell <laughs> that like the 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 yolk came out perfectly and everything else was just a disaster. And like the photograph looked good, but that is not something I'm going to try to teach people. It was a people. disaster with a great outcome. See? Yeah. <laughs> I know how really you good. feel. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Michael Goldman wanted to know, what's your favorite recipe to show off the merits of sous vide? Oh, my favorite recipe is my filet mignon recipe from the cookbook. It's a filet mignon that is paired with a mushroom duxelle and a truffled palm puree with sauteed asparagus. It's delicious. It's a great recipe to start sous vide with. Uh, I want that right now. That sounds yeah. amazing. What goes into the, <laughs> the palm puree? Um, so it's your traditional palm puree where you use the ricer to make it uh, nice and smooth. And it's just truffle oil and cream and butter. Traditional. Heavy, <laughs> delicious. <laughs> and you cook a lot of lamb, right? What's your favorite uh, 
lamb cut to to crank out. Oh, I, well, sous vide rack of lamb is my favorite. It's mm. it's so. Um, I think people think rack of lamb is daunting at times. Maybe people that don't cook it quite often, but it's very easy, and especially to do sous vide, and it is so delicious. I love lamb. I feel like it's intimidating because it's a little non-uniform in size that if you're traditionally doing it, it's easier to overcook specific sections, but Absolutely. I've done it sous vide and yeah, it's dead simple to do. And then just a nice sear. So on simple. Yeah. So simple. What's your favorite um, flavor pairings? Like, you know, do you like doing a crust on it? Do you prefer doing a sauce? What's kind of, what do you like to pair with your rack of lamb? Um, I, in the cookbook, which is also my favorite way to have it, it's paired with a herb crust, but it's very heavy on the herbs and not as heavy on the panko. So it's beautifully green and a taste of mint and basil and coriander and parsley. It's delicious. Nice. Uh, Vittoria Oceano says, best yacht chef I've ever worked with. I'm a fan. This Flamion <laughs> recipe is delicious. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Vicky. <laughs> <laughs> And Warren said he his one of his favorites is your duck recipe. Um, he said that he loves the lamb too. What's your what's your duck recipe? Oh, the duck is very good. Yes, it's very nice as well. So the duck breast that I was doing uh, two weeks ago is I was using sous vide to actually tenderize the duck breast, and then I went forward and did the traditional method where you sear it in the pan. And, but also when it tenderized in the sous vide, it allowed uh, the five spice marinade that I put on it to really infuse into the center of the duck breast and it makes it absolutely delicious. Yes. Mark Webb says that uh, butterflied uh, lamb leg is also super easy using sous vide as well. It's yes, one. yes, it's also very good. Lamb in general, it's so good with sous vide. <laughs> <laughs> I know you do a lot with some of the modernist techniques and ingredients. Um, what's some that you've kind of wow your guests with a little bit that they're not used to necessarily seeing? Well, I like to do uh, the citrus caviar, which is also in the book. If anyone would like to take a double with them, do molecular gastronomy. With the caviar, there's so many applications with that. And people are so wowed by the fact that they think it's going to be this fishy caviar and they take a bite and it just bursts into their mouth with, any flavor you can put into a caviar. That's my funnest one to play with. Yeah, I feel like people always get a kick out of the, the caviars that yeah. because it is just that liquid center and then the just gives it a little bit of pop with the, the What's gel. What's your favorite, Jason? Oh, that's a good question. I, I do a lot of- You are of, the molecular chef. <laughs> <laughs> Probably the thing that I do most is doing gels for like parties when we used to have parties because I would do like a gelled mojito or gelled um, margaritas. And it's like the best jello shots you can ever have. And, uh, you know, use some agar and some uh, locust bean gum. So it gives it a nice bite to it and a little, yeah. little more chew. Definitely. I like that as well. And I always tell people to use, to try airs. Like if they're interested in doing something that's a little fancier, you know, you can make an air with like mm -hmm. some soy lecithin, Mm -hmm. using like soy sauce or balsamic vinegar. Like you don't mm -hmm. have to do a fancy sauce Definitely. and you can turn it into something that looks pretty cool. You know what I use? Um, the mine espresso frother on the cold setting. I just put the soy lithice. I can never say that word. Let's, let's Neither can I. <laughs> I just say it with confidence and pretend like that's the right way. It was good. <laughs> you did, you sounded like you know exactly what you're talking about. <laughs> <laughs> soy lithicin with whatever you want to make the air out of and just turn it on the cold setting. It whips up right beside your dish and you just pour it on. Yep, I have one of, the, uh, one of the handheld milk frothers that's, you know, just does the things for lattes too. It's super easy to do. <laughs> Yeah. Mike liked the, he says, ooh, turning the tables on the host. I love it. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Mike. <laughs> Ron Miller wanted to know, is there an ebook version of the book? There is not as of yet. Uh, perhaps once we have a second or third edition, we'll create an ebook as well. Nice. Uh, Michael Goldman says, uh, without doing plugs, does the new Anova oven have a place in your limited space repertoire, the precision <laughs> oven? If I had one, I would make space. <laughs> <Nice>. <laughs> yeah, I feel like a lot of you know professional kitchens try to use combi ovens and have space in it. So for a yacht, having a smaller version of that is probably a, it's a good 
compromise. It would be nice. It would be very nice. I can just think about what my husband's downstairs saying right now. Not another appliance. <laughs> Not another toy. <laughs> Not another one. She has so many. <laughs> That's what I've been looking at one. I was like, it'd be fun to get one, but like you can kind of see all of my, my counter. That's basically all the counter space I have right there. It's like, and it would fill yeah. it up. Yeah. I, I feel like your, your uh, yacht kitchen is probably the same size as most New York apartment kitchens. Yep, exactly. <laughs> I, I remember this from the book. Uh, Warren says, what about your coral tool? That, uh, was a beautiful preparation. I was like, I don't even know how to make one of those. Can you talk yes. a little bit about what that is? And that's that's the thing on the cover, right? The yeah, that's a very good question, Warren. Uh, the coral tree, it looks very daunting, but it's not. And that's actually one of the first things that people who want to do a cooking lesson, something that I think that is very attractive and very simple to make that they can wow their guests with, is I teach them how to make the coral tree. And it's very simple. It's only three ingredients. You have uh, flour, water, and oil. Uh, four ingredients, I guess. Salt, just for a little bit of taste. And you whisk it together until it looks homogenized. And then you cook it in a saute pan just until it starts stop spitting and boiling. And it comes out this beautiful lattice coral twill. And then you just remove it from the pan and you put it on paper towels. So you remove a bit of the oil and voila, you can serve. And they actually keep in a lidded container for a couple of weeks as well. So you can do that's them in can, advance. That's super convenient. You can make them ahead of time and then use them throughout the next week or two. Yeah, and I use food colorings to make the different colors or you could add a food puree as well, like green and with spinach puree or something like that if you wish. Nice. Yeah. Yeah, I love the preparation on those. It does look like it'd be very painfully like hand yeah. painstaking to do <laughs> people are like how did you do this <laughs> like it's so easy <laughs> mike is working on uh, warren for you he says that sounds like a great christmas present <laughs> yeah <laughs> thanks mike <laughs> <laughs> do you do um ice cream at all using either sous vide or traditional for the yacht i feel like that'd be a something that i would demand during my yacht voyages would be a constant flow of ice cream Oh yes, there is a constant flow of ice cream, sorbets, frozen yogurts, parfaits here. Um, I do use the sous vide for my ice cream bases. Uh, they're you know, no fuss, so you just put it in, displacement method, allow it to cook, uh, remove it, and then let it chill overnight uh, to culture, and then just makes ice cream, and it makes wonderful ice cream. So I do use the sous vide for that. What type of are you forced to like stick to the traditional flavors or do you get to uh, experiment a little bit and have some fun with uh, coming up with new things? Oh, I, I do. I, I experiment for sure. I think last week I made a beet ice cream and next week I was going to make a lemongrass ice cream as well. Nice. Yeah, I feel like with all the, especially if you're hitting up some farmer's markets and stuff like that around, around the globe, you could have some good options for some still simple, but uh, uniquely flavored ice creams. Oh, definitely, definitely, yeah. Mark says he knows that I would be demanding boozy granitas <laughs> the whole time. He knows me so well. <laughs> <laughs> Can't beat a boozy granita. <laughs> Victoria oh, sea said, salt caramel. <laughs> sea salt caramel pecan. That sounds amazing. <laughs> yeah, that's what I made a couple days ago. <laughs> Darren is pitching the next ISVA committee meeting on uh, on your yacht. <laughs> I, I agree. <laughs> Let's do it. It's all we need is all of us uh, out on the high seas. Uh, oh, it would be so much fun. It taking would be over. So much fun. <laughs> <laughs> uh, what vegetables do you really enjoy using sous vide for? You said you've been experimenting with those a little bit more. Yeah, I have been. Um, I'm not as fond of sous vide the green vegetables, but I have been doing recently like potato salads and doing more starchy vegetables. And I did a potato salad last week, which I have to say, a German potato salad, so it was served warm. And I was so impressed with the outcome, just mm -hmm. how the denseness of the potato and it's perfectly cooked throughout. You don't have the ruffled edges from water or things like that. And it just perfectly tastes like a potato. I think I've now converted to making my potato salad sous vide, I have to say. <laughs> That's <laughs> a yeah. one try. Potatoes are very easy with sous vide. And I feel like you'd normally like boil them anyway, which takes out some of the flavors. And 
Exactly. It changed the texture of them. When you do it sous vide, you have this beautiful, perfect, cooked, dense potato product. It tastes exactly like a potato. It's very nice. Well, Chef, I know you are, I'm sure, itching to get back out on the water. I appreciate you taking time out of your really busy schedule and coming on, exploring sous vide, sharing some of your expertise. It was great uh, going through some of the things in your book and learning more about the, just the amazing things that you do. Thank you. And if people want to get a hold of you, they can check you out on Instagram at Chef Elizabeth Lee or at cookbook underscore made with love with all underscores between the words. Uh, Mike's going to drop these in the comments, I think. Um, or they can check out your website at cookbookmadewithlove.com, charteryachtpegasus.com, and eastyachts.com. Are those the best ways? <laughs> <laughs> yes. Thank you very much. Awesome. Well, thank you so much for coming on. Happy sailing. Uh, think of all of us frigid in the snow while you're out there enjoying <laughs> the, the warmth and the, the nice water. And I appreciate you coming on and sharing all of your knowledge. Thank you so much for having me, Jason. And thanks, for everyone, <laughs> and thanks for everyone in the comments uh, and everyone that's listening. Remember, you can join us live every Thursday when we record these episodes. Uh, you can ask the guest questions, talk to the other cooks in the comments, and even see our smiling faces. So join us Thursdays at afmeasy.com slash show or search for Exploring Sous Vide on your favorite podcast platform. This has been Exploring Sous Vide, where we're all about helping you get the most out of your sous vide machine while talking to some of the biggest names in the industry. Till next time, I'm Jason Logston. See you all next Thursday.